after you move from your cell phone to your first entry level DSLR for filmmaking and see how big of a difference the quality is in your videos, almost every filmmaker gets on the kick of always wanting better gear. And you go from your entry level DSLR, then you get a little bit higher level one, then you get a full frame, and then an even better full frame camera. And where do you go from there? Eventually it leads to the cinema camera. So what does this massive thing actually give you as opposed to your typical DSLR or mirrorless camera like this a7 III. We're gonna take a look at some of the main differences, what you can expect as far as quality, ease of use, accessories, all kinds of stuff that you get out of a cinema camera as opposed to your standard high-end DSLR. The biggest difference in what everyone is shooting for when they get a better camera is the best possible image. And when you move to a cinema camera, that opens up all kinds of possibilities in improving your video quality through things like higher bit rates, better codecs. For example, when shooting with this a7 III, you can shoot in the XABCS mode, which is essentially just a long group of pictures type of compression. Whereas with the cinema camera, you can go up to XABCI, which is an interframe recording, essentially less compression on your images. If this sounds confusing, a lot of this is technical. I actually have another video explaining all of that and how one type of compression might be better or worse depending on the type of video you're making. So I'll leave a card up there as well as more information, less compression, fewer artifacts in your videos, better quality overall. With that, you also have the option of shooting raw on this camera. Now, if you don't know what raw is, most cameras have the ability to shoot raw pictures and essentially this is just less stuff that's baked into your image, contrast, sharpness, saturation, those types of things. I also have a video on that as well on picture profiles and how you can use picture profiles on cameras like the a7 III or even lower level cameras or different settings to do to give you that more washed out look so that you have more opportunity to improve the video yourself in post rather than letting your camera doing it, having this stuff baked in and not really being able to take that stuff out. But when you can shoot with raw, essentially that's one step further than picture profiles because nothing's baked in. You just have really high bitrate videos, takes up a lot of space. You need really high capacity memory cards that can process all that data. But when you get to editing, you have the most leeway with being able to get the best quality and dynamic range out of your videos. Now with that higher dynamic range, the higher bit rates, those codecs that allow you to record those extremely high bit rate videos with the higher quality, that's where the drawback of this comes as opposed to this camera because with that, you need really high capacity memory cards that are really expensive. Just looking at the Canon R5, memory cards you need for that are $500 and more and stuff that you get for these cinema cameras or like red cinema cameras, they can be thousands of dollars just for your memory card to be able to record in those extremely high bit rates. And it doesn't stop there because you also have to have a computer powerful enough to do all that work because if you get the footage in your computer, start editing and your computer crashes constantly, that footage is gonna do you no good. So even though the price of $11,000 for a camera like this seems huge compared to this $2,000 camera and you think, well, I'm gonna get the best quality out of this. The money doesn't stop there. You're gonna be paying thousands for memory cards, thousands for better computers, a lot of money on extra hard drives. I got a bunch stacking up right there because all this footage from these videos really piles up really quickly. Now, one of my favorite things about this cinema camera is that it has a built-in ND filter. Now, if you don't know what an ND filter is, essentially it's glasses for your lens so that you don't have to change your shutter speed. You can keep the motion blur how you want. I have a video explaining that more as well. I'll link that for you too so you can check it out. But with a camera like this, you've got to carry ND filters around with you. You see, this is a variable ND I have here. And you have different size lenses, so these are only for a certain lens. And you have to get step down rings as well. And it can be a pain carrying the extra gear. Whereas with this camera, it is built in so you can turn the switch, the ND filter comes on, you can go through a lot of different settings of ND filter to get the exposure just how you want without having to change out shutter speed, aperture, any of that type of stuff. So very useful. And as far as shutter speed goes too, another thing I like about cinema cameras is that it gives you the opportunity to use shutter angle instead of shutter speed. In short, shutter speed controls your motion blur. I have another video I'll link as well if you're new to shutter speed. But what happens with shutter angle is that you can just set that 180 degree shutter on the camera and whether you do 24 frames per second, 60 frames per second, 120 frames per second, it will automatically do the shutter speed needed, which is double the frame rate if you're actually having to change your shutter speed. But that's one less thing you have to think about when you're switching back and forth between different frame rates. You don't have to constantly be changing your shutter speed because the shutter angle will automatically set it to what it needs. 
needs to be for that frame rate to give you that cinematic look of motion blur. And you can change it to different shutter angles as well aside from 180 and it'll keep that constant throughout whatever frame rate you use. And speaking of shutter, you don't get the problem with the cinema camera of the rolling shutter, whereas with these lower end lower end, it's still $2,000, but a7 III or even a cheaper like a6100 or the ZV-E10, I think it is, if you start moving those cameras around, you're gonna get a really wobbly looking image because of the rolling shutter. Whereas with these, the processing is way better. The way it scans for the shutter works a lot better so that you don't have those issues of rolling shutter. But it's not all good. With this setup, obviously it is very large. You can't just throw this in your bag and pull it out anywhere. You've got the body, which is 11 grand just for that. Then you have the lens to add to it. You have this handle that comes with it, but then you have a microphone, which higher quality microphones you can hook up to this. When you have slots to hook in microphones, multiple microphones, multiple SDI out so you can have extra monitors for other people watching as well. There's a lot of good things with this, but the price of that is a larger system. Whereas you kind of get the, you know, all in one package with this, you get your camera lens, a microphone, you're pretty much good to go. You can take the mic off, put it in a camera bag, pull it out really quick, put it together and you are ready to go. Whereas with this camera, not so much. It's gonna take time to set up. You're probably gonna need a team to do a lot of the work and you can't just hold it and shoot easily. You can get a shoulder rig and a handle to go with it and more gear, but that makes it even bigger, heavier, harder to use, harder to maneuver. So. That's something to think about there. This is definitely something you'd wanna use for a planned shoot, not if you're vlogging, because imagine holding this camera up with the lens and all that, like 10 pounds up like this far. That's gonna get tiring really quickly. And with the size also comes the issue of being able to stabilize it, because you could use a steady cam, which is the type of thing you'll probably need with this, because if you try to get this on a gimbal, good luck trying to balance it and having it work. Whereas this, you can pull out your gimbal if you already have it balanced, throw the camera on that. Do it at weddings all the time, following people around, getting great shots. And it's a great tool to be able to use with cameras like this. And if you're just out and about and wanting to be a little more inconspicuous, filming with something like this isn't gonna draw much attention because a lot of people are used to people talking to cameras now, all that type of stuff. But if you pull something like this out, if you're out in anywhere public, you might have people coming up and asking you for a filming permit. I've actually had that happen before. I mentioned all the ports and you have attachment holes all over this, cages you can add to add even more equipment accessories. And that's not a bad thing, that's good because it allows you to get even more out of this camera. And that's something that these don't have because there's limited connectivity. You've got like a mini HDMI in there and some USB ports. So a little bit of connectivity there, but this you're able to get really professional with it. I mean, it's a cinema camera. It's supposed to be making movies. Movies. When you're shooting with this, say you have 4K 24 frames per second, you're shooting it at 3840 by 2160, that is ultra high definition, that is your typical 16 by 9. Whereas this, you can choose different from just that ultra high definition. You can do 4096 by 2160 and that is actual true 4K because you've got 4,000 pixels on the horizontal. You can also choose how much of the sensor you want to use on this. You do have an APS-C mode you can go to on the a7 III and a lot of the Sony cameras, but with this, it's not just that. You can go from using full frame at 6K with some down sampling. You can do a slight crop with 5K down sampling. You can do Super 35 at 4K. You can do full readout of 2K. All kinds of options there, depending on the type of look you want, depending on how you want to use the camera, if you want there to be any kind of down sampling, pixel bending, any of that type of stuff. I know that can get a little technical and you might be thinking, what are all these terms? I'll have more videos coming on those as well, but it can play a huge factor on the quality of your videos. And one of the last main things I'll touch on is that with all these high bit rates, these video codecs that take a lot of processing power, cinema cameras have a built-in fan, which is very useful, especially these are designed to shoot for a long time, and so that's gonna dissipate a lot of the heat and help the camera run even longer. Whereas something like this, it's smaller, you're trying to shoot things like 4K, newer cameras getting 6K, even up to 8K. We all seen how the R5 overheats. There's no fan, so if you're outside, it might be fine inside, you're shooting 4K for a long time, no big deal. You go outside, it's 90 degrees out in the summer here right now. You get this thing out in the sun that happens, you're not gonna be shooting videos very long. So after all that generalized, what to expect from a cinema camera as compared to a typical DSLR or mirrorless camera, is it worth your money? I mean, there is a whole lot more. We could go into hours of all the settings and customizations you could do with this. There is so much involved. But overall, for most people, no. This is gonna be overkill for you. If you're making YouTube videos, if you're vlogging, obviously if you're vlogging, that's not good. It's not gonna be really useful. You can get great images out of these cameras. A lot of production companies even use higher-end DSLRs 
to go along with complementing these cameras because nice thing that Sony has done is you can get the same type of picture profiles on this onto these cameras now so that your footage will look very similar. But if you are someone that wants to be a cinematographer, you want to do this for a living, then yes, getting something like this is going to be a necessity because not only are all the features helpful for what you're gonna be doing, you need to be familiar with all different settings on these types of cameras because you go through the manual with this, it can be very overwhelming when you're just used to all the features that these type of cameras have. You wanna be familiar with that because companies will be using cameras like this and you wanna be able to show up, know what you're doing. But if you are gonna go that route, be aware that just spending $11,000 on this camera body is not all you're gonna need. If you just have a cheaper tripod like this, you're gonna to need to get a more robust tripod to hold this because with this, I do not wanna trust it on this tripod. For one, it's gonna be maxing out the weight limit of it, especially the tripod head. Whereas something like this, you have a counterbalance system, it's a lot more robust, bigger, it can handle all the extra weight. I think this maxes out 11 pounds, where this one's 26 and a half. I actually have a review on this tripod as well, it is extremely good. I'll link that for you to check out if you're wanting to upgrade tripods. But you're gonna need more support equipment, SD cards, computers, hard drives, all the different accessories to go along with this. The stuff adds up quick. You could be looking at 20,000 plus dollars just to have a quality setup rig as well as all the support gear to be able to use the footage that you get from the camera. But let me know down in the comments what type of setup you're using, what your plans are. You just make videos for fun, YouTube videos. Do you wanna be a cinematographer in the future? I'd be interested to know your stories and see where you are in your filmmaking journey. And speaking of that, I have a private Facebook group, link below. I can give you more personalized help on your filmmaking journey there, answer whatever questions you have, and if you made it this far, hit that like button, subscribe if you're new, and hopefully I'll see you soon.